Oh, hey there, nerds. Uh, your results just got back, and my name is Dr. Jordan Breeding, and if I ever have a son, I definitely won't make him a direct follow-up and name him Jordan, because I'd rather you have something really manly like Jeff or Larry or Barabbas. Whatever. Anyway, you're watching a sequel to the previous episode of Your Brain on Crack, the show with perfect internal logic and the only show on crack that hopes you didn't notice that we changed the desk after the first episode because I, I need that desk to edit and this is just a table leaf. But you didn't even notice, did you? Because I'm the Hulk of desks, bitch. I need to concentrate here for a second. My secret is I'm always s sitting at my desk. So today, I diagnose. Rewatching Terminator after T2 is even more fun knowing that Sarah Connor eventually becomes a stone cold badass. But rewatching Terminator after T3, however, is about as disappointing as learning robots can inflate their boobs, but won't do it for me. I can no longer watch any Terminator movie without wondering if those are even Arnold's real butt cheeks or if he's just trying to impress me. And that's what these sequels are like. Arnold's butt cheeks. I love <laughs> Rogue One, a Star Wars story, is basically a feature length attempt to explain why the Death Star was so easy to blow up now that a Wookiee slave got the shits is no longer the official canon explanation. God, I miss the Star Wars books. I loved you. See, Rogue One concludes with a massive battle over the planet Scarif as the rebels attempt to steal the Death Star plans in order to blow that shit up in another movie, and they succeed, and the plans are transferred to Princess Leia's ship using ancient space Wi-Fi. Transmission received. Polar Express Leia and her blockade runner manage to escape chaos and jump into hyperspace just before Darth Vader murders the living hell out of every living thing. I killed them. I killed them all. Bad Anyway, Rogue One retroactively physically places both Leia and Darth Vader at the Battle of Scarif, where Vader watches Leia's exact ship escape with his own presumably very frowny eyes. I mean, just imagine an upset Hayden Christensen under that helmet. And yet when Vader catches up and boards Leia's ship at the beginning of A New Hope, Leia pretends that she's on a diplomatic mission. Except again, Vader literally just watched her fly here from a space battle like seven seconds ago. It'd be just as effective to claim that a force ghost ate the Death Star plans. <laughs> and yeah, Leia's attempt may look ridiculous, but Vader arguably looks even sillier for getting all flustered and arguing with her sad excuse of an excuse. You are part of the Rebel Alliance and a traitor. Take her away! <laughs> I mean, it's hard to believe a mind-reading space wizard would be even remotely thrown by, oh no, you must be looking for some other princess who recently come from off-limits planet where major data theft occur. I was on way to space Walmart to buy space Twinkies for me, all American. Nerf herder! During the Avengers second act, Loki pulls what's known as a classic Joker move. Basically, he allows himself to be captured by the titular super squad. Whilst in prison, Loki plays a bunch of mind games with the heroes. He reveals S.H.I.E.L.D. owns a special cell designed specifically to hold and kill the Hulk, he tricks Thor into getting locked up, and he murders everybody's favorite dad character. You should try Ben's chili bowl. Yeah, I know. And that's all well and good and trickster godlike of Loki, but he really could have done way, way more because just one year later, in Thor The Dark World, the MCU's worst movie since... Thor, Loki shows Thor the full range of his illusion powers. He can change his own appearance, the appearance of his whole prison cell, and even the appearances of other people. Mmm, brother, you look ravishing. With all that power, what the hell was Loki doing d around and making people just a little bit upset? You people are so petty and tiny. Instead of merely escaping, for example, Loki could have impersonated Nick Fury and gone around giving Mother contradictory orders on this Mother helicarrier and providing his army a key strategic advantage. Snakes! Loki could have made Maria Hill look like somebody trying to steal Thor's autumnal mead so Thor would bash her skull in with Mjolnir. Or Loki could have made himself look like Steve Rogers and then seduced Tony Stark and manufactured both group sexual tension and tasty fan service. Why shouldn't the guy let off a little steam? You know damn well why. Back off. Oh, I'm starting to want you to make me. Take that off. I mean, can you imagine thinking you'd hooked up with leading man super hunk Chris Evans only to realize it was actually leading man super hunk Tom Hiddleston? I was very upset. But instead, Loki just straight leaves and goes on to fight the battle hoping it's enough to just be a skinny, pale dude with a dumb helmet. 
Loki employs all this incredible destructive power to ultimately do little more than call Black Widow a slut and strategically eliminate S.H.I.E.L.D.'s assistant to the regional director. I am burdened with glorious purpose. Cinematic masterpiece, Star Trek Beyond, ends with a massive drone army destroyed by VHF radio waves transmitting sabotage by the Beastie Boys. The joke is that Star Trek is set in the 23rd century, meaning the Beastie Boys is now considered classical music, and robots and I would rather commit suicide than listen to it. How shitty is the state of galactic culture that the Beastie Boys are apparently the only 20th century band anybody still listens to is a question for another drunker time. I feel rather strange. But if Sabotage by the Beastie Boys is Star Trek canon, then it stands to reason their entire back catalog is as well, including the poetic lyrics to Intergalactic. Like a bitch on the neck of Mr. Spock! The Beastie Boys were apparently aware of Mr. Spock 250 years before he was born. Either there was some other pinch-happy Mr. Spock hanging out on Earth three centuries before the movies began who was a big enough celebrity that his reference in a rap song would make sense, or the Star Trek TV show's existence in-universe is also canon, which implies that Gene Roddenberry accurately predicted most of Earth's future history centuries before it arrived. And yet he didn't even think to warn us about Star Trek Beyond. Keep in mind, the 2009 Star Trek movie establishes a brand new timeline technically distinct from the original show and films, so the show could still exist in this timeline, and if it did, I mean, it stands to reason it became so popular that James Tiberius Kirk and Inyota Yura are just insanely common names everybody has now. Jim, 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 Jim. Presumably, every major development in human history in the new timeline was like, hey, we should name our new Space Discovery Initiative Starfleet, like from that show we all love. Oh, hell yeah. And let's name our new government the United Federation of Planets. Oh, shit. I'm going to name all seven of my kids Leonard Bones McCoy. And on and on and on for centuries until real life perfectly finally synced up with that weird ass show from the 1960s. And I guess by then they were so out of ideas they just started driving motorcycles around looking for purpose in their crappy, meaningless lives. The Harry Potter books and movies may be full of silly fantastic plot devices, but I expect some consistency in my silly fantastic plot devices, Damn it! The world you create doesn't have to be simple, but it does have to be clear. Case in point, there's a special type of spell in the Potterverse whereby a location can be hidden forever as long as the secret of its existence is kept by a designated secret keeper. While hiding from the murderous vul- vul- I can't- uh, he who must not be named, Harry Potter's parents made their old pal Peter Pettigrew their secret keeper, but unfortunately, Pettigrew betrayed the Potters and DM'd their address to vul- <laughs> shit. <laughs> then Pettigrew uh, shapeshifted into a rat and spent more than a decade hiding inside a young boy's pants. And if you've never seen Harry Potter, I have to stress that no part of that last sentence is a joke. Turn this stupid fat rat yellow. <laughs> Anyway, he who must not be named uses the information to find and kill the Potters in front of their surprisingly resilient baby, thus kicking off this entire franchise. But here's the thing. It turns out the Potters didn't have to take the risk of entrusting someone else, voyeuristic rats or otherwise, with our secret. In Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, we learn not only can you totally make someone living in your own house the secret keeper, it could be yourself. Who could possibly figure that out? Hell, they could have used double protection and become each other's secret keepers, just like how the random old man at the hardware store suggested I wrap it up twice when I mentioned I was heading off to college at the end of the summer, and, and I was like, can I just go to my car? Literally nothing in the series would have happened if the Potters had just read the fine print on the secret keeper spell book they purchased on Amazon. How could I be so stupid? Um... Okay, yeah. Uh, mocked the deaths of a wizard orphan's parents, laid the foundations for a Rule 34 Avengers movie, and investigated whether Arnold's ass truly can't quit. Yep, got it all in. Uh, join us next appointment when I diagnose your butt for once, you girly man. Oh my god, did Arnold write that? Is he here? Okay, um, quickly, go see Kathy on your way out for some drugs for your leprosy. Wow, cool, biblical. And, and you know what they say, the Bible is the sequel to history, so full circle. Go, 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 go. Subscribe, hit the bell.